I actually delivered this presentation to the Metro Boston chapter in uh, September 2020. And uh, that actually proved to be a very popular presentation of, of mine. And I actually realized that rebalancing proves a little bit more challenging to people than I had personally perceived. So that's a bit of a side effect of being uh, an Excel nerd is that sometimes I forget that people are not as number-minded as I am. So anyway, I tweaked a little bit this presentation uh, since then, not much, and uh, Greg asked me to deliver it. So here we are. Okay, just need to make sure okay, this is working. Okay, so the what you know, of course, is that it's not necessary to own many farms to, to diversify. If we just own a few diversified index funds, the funds themselves providing diversification, then we are, we are good enough. So which means that any bugglehead ends up with a target asset allocation. So here I took uh, one of the uh, Favorite examples of, uh, of uh, some folks on the forum, a 60% stack, 40% bonds uh, portfolio with a bit more diversification in terms of splitting the stocks in a chunk of US market and uh, another chunk of uh, total international. So this is just an example. So the if we go back to the asset allocation um, a wiki page, then the, the fact of dividing your entire portfolio among asset categories or asset classes is what is, it, this is the asset allocation. So, okay, you're good to go ahead, you define the target and uh, then what? So what, Jack Bogle kept hammering with uh, absolute wisdom is that it is really essential to, to stick to your plan. It's not a matter of uh, just dividing your assets the right way. Uh, you, want to, you want to stick with it and you want to stick with it for, for decades. So that is what we are going to discuss, uh, some of the mechanics in order to stick with your plan. So let's take another example. Let's say that you define a, an asset allocation and there uh, you like round numbers. So you have maybe four asset classes. Uh, just for fun, let's say that it's US stocks, US international stocks, 20% bonds, and maybe 25% gold if you are a gold bug. But anyway, that's your asset allocation to begin with. And then some time passes and uh, maybe some of the stocks are going down. Maybe bonds are going up a little bit and uh, maybe gold is actually going up a good bit. Who knows? Fact is things change over time. So in a year or so, usually it doesn't change that much, although it's not always true. But maybe after a couple of years, we have much more significant changes. And uh, here we are, we have 34% gold and that's definitely too much compared to, compared to our plan. So obviously what we want to do is to come back to our plan. And that is the process of rebalancing. So it's really taking whatever split you currently have in your portfolio based on whatever happened in the recent past and then readjusting the spits so that you are back to your plan. So it seems pretty probably pretty obvious what I'm saying, but if we read discussions on the forum or various literature about it, people always try to, or many people or often try to look at rebalancing as a way to do market timing that might work 
uh, as a way to extract a little bit of a so-called rebalancing bonus or to take opportunities when the stock market will drop or, or things like that. And well, we'll see through my presentation, but those things actually, <laughs> they just don't really exist. Uh, rebalancing bonus and so on, it's, it's pretty illusory. It, it just doesn't materialize very much or, or if, if, if any. In my opinion, the thing which is absolutely crucial about rebalancing is very, very simple. It's just come back to your plan. It's as simple as that. It's a discipline like brushing your teeth. Every now and then I come back to my plan. So I'm going to take an example and I'm going to use, of course, a small spreadsheet because I like spreadsheets. And uh, this, the spreadsheet I'm going to use is accessible online. There, will, there are links in this presentation. And uh, actually, I know that the Metro Boston fellows, uh, some of them uh, used it. So here I am. Here I will take maybe a slightly more realistic asset allocation to illustrate various points. So let's assume that we have our plan. Our target is to have 40% US bonds, 25% US stocks, 25% uh, international stocks. So somebody being really uh, planning to invest with the world and uh, maybe adding a teeny bit of a tilt with 10% uh, of real estate investment trust, which have been described as providing a little bit of a, of a bonus, although the evidence is a little bit flimsy. So anyway, whatever the reasoning, this is our target. Now, there are all sorts of reality checks that I, I would like to, to point out through my examples. One of those reality checks is that an asset allocation is something that should be defined over your entire portfolio, but real life being what it is, uh, you probably have multiple types of investment accounts. So in my case, and I think that's actually pretty common, I have a taxable account, a brokerage account, uh, where I put some ben big bonuses and stock options that I was lucky enough to get through my uh, high-tech career. And uh, then I also saved very regularly on a 401k and my wife uh, did the same. So we have a couple of traditional IRAs and we have been doing Roth conversions over the past, the past few years. And our Roth IRA has been uh, nicely growing. So anyway, that's, that's just me, but I, I think it's quite typical to have something which is split that way, a taxable account, a tax shelter account and a tax-free account, or maybe uh, some of them. So here is my little spreadsheet. So please pay attention because I'm going to use that format a good deal. I designed it so that it is very simple and the formulas I believe are extremely easy to understand, but uh, please bear with me a little bit when I explain. So here, what I did is that I put rows and you can see the three types of accounts that I was speaking of, a taxable account, a traditional IRA, or maybe a 401k and, and the Roth IRA. Now within each of those accounts, I, I made choices. So maybe I'm more keen on keeping stocks in, a, in the Roth and the taxable account. And maybe I'm more keen on putting bonds in the IRA. And that's strategy kind of planning for a controlled growth in the, the IRA so that requirement minimum distributions will not be too much of a pain uh, down the road. I'm not there yet, I'm not 72 net yet, but if you want to know my age, you just have to ask Jean because she knows everything, obviously. <laughs> hey, uh, Jerome, I have a, a 
question, a clarification request. Uh, someone wants to know if the REITs, if, if you're referring to just United States REITs. Yeah, it doesn't really matter for the example, but uh, typically, yes. The, actually, if I can digress for one second, uh, the uh, US REITs are defined in a way which is not very consistent with uh, international REITs. And I actually don't, <laughs> I kind of forgot the, the details. Uh, so I think most people are using a tilt towards rates. They actually use US rates. But okay, anyway, that, that was just an example of an asset class. Really, the, the asset class I'm using are not important for, for rebalancing. I'm just trying to be uh, concrete here. So the cells in yellow are, uh, this is where data needs to be entered in my little spreadsheet and the cells in the gray are automatically calculated. So the idea is that whenever you take a snapshot of your investments, you enter your current positions for each fund in the corresponding row. So here for total US market in taxable, I have 100K and then I have 150K for international. Now you might notice a subtle detail is that in, my, in the 401k here, we are often a little bit constrained by the choices of in, index funds which are, which are available. And uh, those 401k managers, they tend to not give that many choices. So here I used a very typical example is that there might be an index fund which is about the S&P 500, but there is no such thing as a total market index fund in the 401k. And that's good enough. I mean, it's, it's close enough to total market. So I'm not going to, I'm going to put that, all of that as US stocks, not try to, to split hairs. Okay, so we have those yellow entries, which you would update every now and then to, to capture your, your, uh, your current positions. Then my little spreadsheet, the entire point is to figure out if we are close to target asset allocation. So if you look at row three, I put in gold or orange, the target asset allocation, what, what's my plan? And the spreadsheet will, will tell you where you currently are. And here you can see in row four that I made it so that it actually, uh, uh, it is perfectly balanced. So let's explore a little bit the mechanics. The sum of the portfolio is on cell D6. It's very easy, just the sum of the individual funds. And then in the, in the middle, I put some extremely simple formulas to refer to the various funds, but I put that little re reference in the appropriate column so that I can sort by I can allocate per, per asset class. So I put the bonds in the in current I because that's where they belong. And again, back to my little subtlety, the S&P 500 on total market, I viewed them as being part of the same asset class, namely uh, US stocks. Okay, so far, I think everybody can follow that for spreadsheet. And uh, then I summed up Per, per column. So I have the totals per asset class. And again, it's a very simple formula of making a sum of a given column. And then there is a teeny bit more mechanics to compute the current asset allocation. So if we take the current total, let's say cell I6, 400K, and I divide by the current total portfolio, 400K divided by 1 million equal 40%. So yeah, I am right on target. Okay, so that's actually pretty much all there is for my, my little spreadsheet. So let me stop for one second. Greg, are there any clarification questions here about the spreadsheet? Because I, uh, I don't see any other questions. questions in chat at the moment. Okay. All right, very good. Okay, let's move on then. Okay, now Mr. Market, of course, 
is doing its thing of always surprising us year after year. So let's take an example. After in the course of one year, oh cool, the US tax really went up. International tax are less exciting, but they did go up. Real estate was a little bit of a bust for whatever reason. And maybe the US bonds went down a, a tiny bit because of whatever decision from the, the Federal Reserve about interest rates. So before I do any kind of math, it's pretty obvious that those, those changes will uh, get our asset allocation a little bit out of whack, notably because of the US tax uh, changing a good deal. So here, what I did is that I updated the numbers in yellow to capture those market changes. So if you remember in the, for the two total market US VTI for my uh, taxable account, I had 100K. It went up 20%, so okay, it's now 120, uh, 120K. So I updated the various positions here according to the market changes. Uh, but in reality, what you would do is that you would just connect your investment accounts and see, oh, here is where I am. I'm just going to plug my numbers. So once you do that, suddenly the simple calculations I, I explained before show that there is indeed an negligible mismatch between the current asset allocation and the target asset allocation. So if you come back to the examples of the bonds, if we divide the, the, the bonds, which fell a little bit by the total of the portfolio, we ended up, we end up with 38%, which is of course not exactly aligned with the target, but yeah, not too far. Now, if we look at US stocks, US stocks, they, they dropped for the two funds which are associated with them. And the, uh, uh, no, they didn't drop, they, they increased, sorry. They increased a good deal. And unsurprisingly, uh, the asset allocation is for your current portfolio is now at 29% which is a little bit of a departure from, from your target. So you see that very simple math here of organizing the funds per column and per asset class, I can see where I am very easily compared to, compared to my target. The other thing I did is that percentages are all nice and, uh, and handy, uh, but concrete dollars <laughs> is, is probably what, what matters the most in terms of actual impact to, to what's going on. So I kind of skipped row seven in my previous explanation. Here I put a formula, which is a bit more complicated. What I did is that I want to figure out how far I am from where I would like to be. So my bonds are currently at 392, and this is 38% of the portfolio. So the formula is essentially computing the target asset allocation, 40% of the total, and then checking the delta as a difference with what I currently have. So what's happening here is that if I were to add 25K and the unchange to my US bond positions, then I would be back to, to my target. Conversely, if you look at US stocks, I have an excess of 30, 38K unchange. So if I were to sell $38,000 from US tax, then I would be back to my target of, of 25%. So I think that's handy to, to see the, the concrete dollar impact. And the, but that also gives you a really good hint on the, what to do about it. 
So here, I would like to rebalance or at least get closer to my target asset allocation. And uh, I really would advise you to not be obsessively precise about things. You just want to get roughly in shape and closer to, closer to your target. But things change all the time anyway. So being, being, uh, being a little bit OCD about things is not necessarily helping. So looking at my row seven, where there is one move that seems to be very easy to do, what if I take $30,000 out of the US stocks in my traditional IRA and I move that amount of money to the US bonds where I have actually, I would like to add 25K. So if I do such a very simple 30K exchange in the traditional IRA, then I should be much closer to my target. And that's very easy to do in an IRA. Uh, you can schedule an exchange, uh, notably with mutual funds at the end of the day. And that will take some money out of a given fund, add some money, add the corresponding money to the other fund. And here you are, it's done. So that's also why I wanted to explain that kind of little spreadsheet is that not only it takes a snapshot of where you are, but that's actually a good helper for you to try to figure out what kind of move uh, you might want to do. Uh, Jerome, is, is this particular spreadsheet uh, available as a sample? Yes, it is. So in the very last slide, uh, you will see uh, there will be a link to this little spreadsheet. And as I said, the Metro Boston folks found it useful. Actually, I was kind of surprised because I made it mostly to illustrate and explain my points, but uh, it ended up being handy to for people to use it as in real life. Thank you. So once I do that exchange of uh, of uh, rebalancing, I have an issue with my arrows. <laughs> okay, anyway. So after doing that exchange, I moved 30K out of US stocks and into US bonds. Once I enter the new, uh, the new positions in the, the day after my exchange, suddenly we see that the asset allocation is looking pretty good. Yeah, we have a one person disconnect here and there, but again, that's that's really nothing. So in that case, personally, I would suggest that you just sit there happy and uh, you just wait uh, another year to, to do something about it. So now, what if you are actually not eager to listen to my advice and you do want to make it perfect. Well, the, then it gets a little bit trickier because the biggest problem, which is not really big, quite frankly, is that there are some, uh, there's some money which is missing on the, on, the, uh, on the real estate side of things. And again, looking at row seven, the logical move is to take money out of US stocks and maybe money out of US bonds and put that in real estate. But look, I have a bit of a tactical problem here is that my real estate, I put them in Roth IRA just because I have that belief that this is high growth uh, asset and therefore I'd rather have it grow tax-free. And in this Roth IRA, I cannot really do an exchange as I want because I don't really have, uh, uh, I don't really, really have US stocks or US bonds to, to take from. So here, this is where you need to think a little more. And, uh, and it, it all depends on the, your current situation. But here I would suggest that a very simple solution is to indeed take some money out of US stocks and bonds and just add a new position of real estate in your traditional IRA. Then you can do a very simple exchange transaction 
without any tax impact and uh, you will be good to go. So that has been kind of my life over the past uh, 10 years as I've been rebalancing in a fairly disciplined manner is that I ended up playing a little bit of a game of Tetris uh, between my various, uh, my various asset classes. And yeah, sometimes I end up adding new funds in a given account or, or maybe eliminating it. But as long as you, you, you think a little bit and you're a little bit wary about a possible tax impact, usually you find a fairly easy solution. So here I did uh, what I just suggested is that I, did, I performed an exchange, taking some money, 9K, I believe, out of the US stocks, taking a bit more money out of the US bonds and creating that new position for real estate. And here we are, we have a perfect current asset, current asset allocation or nearly perfect. And, um, and we are happy. So again, I, I really would not encourage you to be that, uh, that obsessive. Uh, I just wanted to show an example where rebalancing ends up uh, creating uh, or adding a new fund position in an IRA and that's, that's perfectly fine. Any question, Greg, that they should address? Uh, I think we'll hold back some of the questions that I'm seeing for the end, and we'll have Ke Kevin will be moderating that. Okay, good. Okay, let's move on. That was pretty uh, basic, but so I, I went through that, but I'm going to repeat it. It's really important to think of your asset allocation across your entire portfolio. Uh, the fact that you have multiple accounts, taxable, tax sheltered, tax free, maybe a 401k, maybe a 403b, maybe uh, an annuity of where you save some money or whatever. Those are tactical considerations which are usually driven by, by taxes. And, uh, but, and that changes. I mean, the, as I early retired, as Jean found out, the, uh, I actually moved, I rolled over a 401k onto an IRA. Uh, my wife uh, just retired, we did, we did something, something similar, and we simplified a little bit our accounts. I mean, all that account management is very tactical. Your asset allocation should not care about those, those, uh, those considerations. It's really your entire portfolio, you have a target, and this is what you should look at. So as I tried to, to emphasize, uh, don't try to be overly precise. Uh, close enough is good enough. Um, the market keeps changing anyway. So you just want to get close to the target as opposed to be perfectly on target and then of the day after. So now those pesky taxes, when you rebalance, you end up selling and buying. And uh, it would be cool to not pay taxes when you do that. So if you can act within your tax sheltered accounts and tax sheltered and tax free accounts, so IRA, IRA type, 401k, Roth IRAs and, and so on, then when you buy and sell, nothing is taxed because of those transactions. So that's cool. Now in some cases, Notably, when you are like me and you have a sizable taxable account, it gets a little bit more complicated because you may have to, you, you cannot find any other way than selling some position in a taxable account. And then it gets a little bit tricky because on one hand, you would like to come back to target, to stick to your plan. On the other hand, you might trigger capital, capital gains on taxes because of, the fact that you are going to sell and buy, or oh, the fact of selling. So if you have some positions in the red, uh, then that's fine. <laughs> you don't have capital gains, uh, go for it. Don't be shy to sell positions which are, which are at a loss that would actually be helpful for your taxes. 
that if you don't, then well, you, you would have to make a call. Should I just rebalance maybe a little less in order to reduce a little bit the, the pain on the capital gains? Or should I just do it and be, be done with it? But again, taxable accounts are a little bit tricky when it comes to rebalancing and I don't have an easy answer here. So mutual fund exchanges in tax shelter or in Roth are super convenient. You can do the sell and the buy at the same time. That might either involve three, four, whatever assets in, in one go. And uh, everything is synchronous. So that's, uh, it all happens at the same time. So that's very convenient. The other thing which is a little bit annoying about taxable accounts is that you'd better do things quickly and therefore think twice before acting. Uh, you cannot do an exchange in a taxable account. You have to sell a position, that's one transaction, and then the money is available to buy something else. And if you happen to rebalance on the day where stocks are, are bouncing up and down, you might have some annoying uh, uh, thing happening right in between your sell on, on the buy. So, okay, things don't change by 10% or 20% in, in, in a few minutes, but, uh, but still, I would really advise you think twice, prepare your transactions on paper and uh, the number of shares and so on, and then better, better do it relatively quickly. Jerome, would uh, one thing to address that, would that be to perhaps consider buying it close to the end of the market day? I would not advise to do that actually, because if you do that, you are a little bit under pressure of really completing it before it closes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And nothing tells you that at the end of the day, things are less bouncy than during the day. It's actually at the end of the day, if only because of those leveraged funds, there is usually quite some activity. So yeah, personally, I do that midday. Uh, I want to be awake <laughs> and I want to think and I want to take my time to prepare and then act quickly. Okay. Now, if you end up having to do something a little bit more complicated, where you have to do something in taxable and something in tax sheltered, then I would start to agree with you because maybe I want to sell something in, in taxable and do an exchange in tax sheltered, which will be done at the end of the day. So then I might want to reduce a little bit the time window of the overall uh, set of transactions. But again, that's, that's a little bit of, being obsessively precise. I, mean, that's, I think the main point is really to think before acting. So I am one of those guys using tilt. So actually I, I do not use real estate as one of my tilts. I lied. <laughs> and, uh, but I do use small cap value on the emerging on the, on things like that as a, as a tilt. And then my portfolio is actually, I use very round numbers, 20%, 10%, things like that, but I have seven asset classes. And, uh, and then I, yeah, after 10 years of doing it, uh, sometimes I really have to scratch my head a little bit on how to rebalance without uh, triggering taxes. And, uh, and then I, I moved from accumulating to, to retirement on withdrawings and that's changed a little bit the dynamics and so on. So I would say, if you like tilt, uh, you'd better be a little bit math on spreadsheet minded. Uh, otherwise, yeah, it's yet another reason to keep an asset allocation very simple to three or four funds because that will make your rebalancing life uh, simpler. Now, after explaining those things on my little spreadsheet, I am sure that some of you people, your eyes are glazing over and you just don't like spreadsheets. You know, not the very math inclined and rebalancing might prove a bit of a challenge. And I actually know some people 
I'm not going to give names from the Metro Boston chapter who are not rebalancing because they just cannot get the hang of it. Well, that's okay. I mean, everybody has their own skills. And uh, so, but if math and spreadsheets are not your strong suit, then I would strongly advise that you use an all-in-one fund or several all-in-one funds and take a pick. Maybe it's a target retirement, which is slowly shifting towards more bonds. Maybe it's a life strategy fund. Uh, Vanguard has such funds, which is all-in-one, but with a fixed asset allocation. It doesn't shift over time. But those funds are great because you can really be fully diversified US international bonds, US bonds and international bonds actually. And they rebalance for you. Every day they are going to rebalance uh, your, uh, your funds. So then your life is much simpler and you can stop listening to my ramblings. So for those of you who do not want to do that. Let's keep going. But I, I'm serious here. I mean, there are, there are really many people who can really benefit from using a single fund, a strategy, uh, a fund of funds. Uh, I have three boys, uh, uh, and they are two of them are in their late twenties, and one of them is in his early twenties. All of them have a Roth IRA right now, and one of them has actually more than that. And uh, so far, they use a single fund because I'm boring them when I explain my financial stuff. So I ended up advising that they do something very simple and very, they are very happy about it. And I don't think they have a clue about rebalancing, and that's fine. Okay, so if you do want to stick with multiple asset classes, you do want to rebalance every now and then. The question is, when? When should we do that? And that leads to endless discussions on studies. And of course, I did my own study. So there are kind of two primary ways of doing it at the, at the top level. The first thing is that if you are an accumulator, you add money to your portfolio because on a regular basis, or at least you should, because you're saving. And when you are a retiree, it's exactly the reverse way around. Every now and then you withdraw money because well, you want to pay your bills and uh, enjoy life. So when you add or uh, withdraw money, it's actually, a good opportunity to do a teeny bit of rebalancing. Maybe not put everything back in order, but at least make one move that, that will uh, go in the right direction. So this is my terminology. Uh, I tend to speak of soft rebalancing when doing that, just adding on withdrawing money and make uh, 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 one simple move in the right direction. The topic which is discussed much more often is to have a full rebalancing of your portfolio. And uh, many people do that on a specific uh, day of the year. Maybe you do that early January. Personally, I don't like to be a sheep and do the same as everybody else. So I'd rather do that on my birthday. Some people might be cute and do that on their wedding anniversary. Or whatever, pick a day, do that annually. That is kind of a very, very simple way of, of proceeding. And it is actually surprisingly good. But some people, including me, <laughs> they don't like that. And uh, kind of makes me indirectly uh, it's not satisfying. And I'd rather have something which is triggered by big changes in my current asset allocation. So I'm going to go through that in more details, but some people have little formulas based on absolute percentage of change. 
something which is more a relative percentage. Somebody on the forum called Long Invest and myself, we came up with something called the adaptive rebalancing, which has slightly better mathematical properties. And, uh, and there's a little known mechanism, which I discovered relatively recently, which is called cumulative drift, which I think is actually pretty clever. So what was the name of that, that, Jerome? It was that uh, community drift? Cumulative drift. Oh, yeah. cumulative. Okay, okay. Got it. Yeah, those vowels, they torture me. <laughs> I can never see, see them right. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm, going, I'm going to come back to that. Okay, personally, I have absolutely no issue with, I mean, I, yeah, I, I can argue about details on those various types of triggers, but they all work. They, they just all work. Something where I have strong feelings, and I've seen that a lot in March, 2020, when COVID started to, to mess with our lives on the stocks dropped 30%, 30% in a month. That was unprecedented. I know a lot about financial history and because I've been playing with so many backtesting spreadsheets on the stocks dropping 30% in a month. I mean, that, that was new. At that time where everybody was emotionally distraught, quite a few people were saying, Oh, oh, wait, stocks are dropping, are dropping, are dropping. I don't want to rebalance. I'm going to sell my good solid bonds to buy stocks. I don't want to fall on the knife. That's a really bad idea. <laughs> uh, this, this is a pure, purely emotional thinking. There is actually a market timing idea behind that, if you, if you really uh, think about it because clearly those people are thinking that they will rebalance when, stock, when the stock market is getting a little bit more stable. Uh, then, yeah, okay. When do you decide that exactly? Huh, good question. And, and it's, and I actually tried to backtest when we're rebalancing uh, through a fancy study I'm going to explain a little bit later, and you end up having situations where you may not rebalance for 10 years, or all sorts of crazy things. So when we are rebalancing, uh, just sell bond, just uh, buy sell stocks to buy bonds, but never sell bonds to buy stocks. Uh, that is probably the only topic in that presentation where I have a very strong bias towards uh, not doing it. Uh, that being said, I do acknowledge that in the midst of a, a very deep crisis, like at the end of March, everybody was freaking out. I, I took the talk, but I was freaking out too. And uh, maybe there is a point where you reach an emotional rock bottom and uh, rebalancing is just too much. So, okay, maybe don't do it then if your emotions are, are really too strong, but uh, yeah, it's, it's really not a good idea. So um, that was just one example of winging rebalancing based on emotions or market timings, but again, Read now that we are in a more stable environment, well, or at least we were a few weeks ago before Russia started to mess up with the world. Uh, the reading again those threads from 2020, you will see that quite a few experienced bogleheads were discussing winging rebalancing decisions based on emotions. And uh, winging it, emotions, that's just the worst thing to do. So, uh, Jerome, may I uh, interject something? Yep. Uh, it sounds to me like you're when you talk about never selling bonds to buy stocks in one way rebalancing, the bad part of this is reacting to your own emotions. But suppose that you're, you have cold blood and the market is way down and you're just seeking to rebalance. Maybe it's your anniversary on, you know, on the third week of March, and it just happens to be way down. 
Is there a particular reason other than just not reacting to your emotions that it would be a bad idea? Yeah, there is another reason is that if you are not going to do it according to your plan on your on your anniversary, when are you going to do it? Are you going to make a decision, gut feeling decision when stock starts to recover? By how much? How are you going to decide that? So it's not only that you will make one emotional decision to not stick to your plan, but you also put yourself in a position where you would have to make another decision down the road, which will obviously be market timing and very likely somewhat driven by emotions too. So if your plan was to uh, to sell bonds and buy stocks when, when stocks drop uh, 30%, and that's part of your plan, and to rebalance at another point later on, uh, that would be acceptable to you because that's part of your plan, not a reaction. But if it is part of your plan, like a plan defined in advance, yeah, uh, maybe based on triggers, for example, right. that's fine. Okay. But what I'm saying is that making an instant decision, oh, my plan says I should rebalance, but then I don't want to do it because uh, I'm yeah. emotionally disturbed. That's a bad idea in two respects. A, because you are not going to follow your plan right away. And B, because at some point you are going to have to rebalance and you are going to, to kind of uh, wing it again. So what I'm trying to say here is just stick to your plan. Got it. Stick to your rebalancing plan. Okay. Okay, so in practice, big bull markets or big bear markets, they actually, they don't occur very, very often. So most of the time the stock is, the, the market is kind of inching upwards, going a little bit uh, sideways and up and down, but, uh, but not gyrating a lot. So if you are in a, such a semi-steady, not a very exciting situation, the soft rebalancing, the fact of doing small rebalancing moves when you save money or when you withdraw money, it is surprisingly good enough. And uh, most of the time you are actually, you will not see your asset allocation going much out of whack because of not, uh, not doing more than that. So yeah, prob you probably will want to do an annual check, just see where you are. You may very well decide, yeah, good enough. And that's it, done. So really the big rebalancing uh, uh, shifts, notably when you have a trigger method, really occur when there is a crisis and it's not very, uh, not very often. But again, coming back to the previous topic, that is right where you have emotions flowing. So you'd better have a good plan ahead of time and just stick with it. Okay, so let me uh, illustrate a little bit more this soft rebalancing thing. So, kind of repeating what I said, accumulators tend to save money on a regular basis, and maybe they also have the occasional bonus on the, the lump sum. So, well, the, the, the trick here is to assess your current asset allocation just enter those current positions in my little spreadsheet or something similar. And okay, where am I? And then you will probably spot the fact that there is an asset class which is below target. And well, you have money to save, just put money there. If you have an asset class which is below target, that is where you want to add money. And that's what I mean by a small uh, rebalancing move. So some people might leave their 401k account, contribute, split the, the savings according to your target. That will also help a bit going back to target. But then uh, again, if, if that would be if you have a lump sum, I would strongly suggest go take a look at that point to your, where you are, and you will probably want to, to do a, a, a small move of shifting money towards the, uh, the asset, which is the most below target. Then you retire at some point, lucky you. 
as Jin said, I love my freedom. <laughs> it's really cool to be able to do whatever I want, whenever I want, but that will cost some money. So you need to withdraw at some point. So personally, I tend to withdraw $20,000 at a time, roughly, that will last uh, as my, my wife and myself uh, a few months, and then, then I do it again. So same thing, same idea, just take a look at where your various funds are, enter them in the rebalancing spreadsheet, and where are you? Well, there might be an asset class which is above target, and this is where you want to withdraw the dollar from. And, uh, and then there is one thing which is a little bit more complicated, but I ended up making an express slide for that, so I will come back to it. So when you do that, that soft rebalancing of adding money to an asset which is below target or maybe withdrawing from an asset which is above target, this gives a perception of selling high and buying low. It is mostly an illusion because <laughs> market timing doesn't work. So you never know if you did it at the right time. And maybe if you would have waited a few more days, that would have been better or, or maybe not. It's really an illusion, but it's a handy illusion because it feels good. So here I'm shifting a little bit onto a less uh, numerical kind of explanation. And I'm starting to make more and more comments about behavioral things about behavior and psychology. Rebalancing, wait, that, the, again, set, that gives you that perception of setting high buying low, that makes you feel good. And if your financial discipline makes you feel good, then you are going to stick with it more on, uh, 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 better and better. So it took me several years to figure that out, but uh, really I, I kind of like rebalancing. It's not only it makes me stick to my plan, but I'm feeling good by, by doing it. And if some of my perception is actually a bit of an illusion, then yeah, fine, I'll take it. I feel good. So again, soft rebalancing, it's one simple move. And maybe you still want to take a look at the end of the year or maybe based on triggers at your entire portfolio. But quite often you will be, you will discover that you are actually fine. Okay, so being a little bit heavy handed, let me illustrate that soft rebalancing with my little spreadsheet. So, okay. Mr. Market did whatever it did, and here is your current portfolio, and you have some money to add. Well, take a look at this ND row seven, and you see right away that bonds are missing. You are at 38%, you would like to be at 40%, that's 25K. Well, if you're an accumulator, the logical move to make is to contribute to your four to your 401k or your IRA, if you can, and then buy bonds. And by simple virtue of buying bonds, you are going to put your asset allocation a little bit closer to, to where it should be. Conversely, if you are an, a retiree, well, here, Mr. Market has been nice with the US market and uh, you have, too much actually US stocks compared to your, what your plan is telling you to do. Well, now it's time to sell US stocks and the logical move would probably be to sell from your taxable account. And then I'm going to trigger capital gains, but that's fine because I'm withdrawing money uh, in order to, to, to spend and it's perfectly normal to, to pay taxes at that point. So those are, two very easy cases. Now, I've been facing another case, which is a little bit more tricky. 
Let's say you are an early retiree, uh, less than 59, and you, well, you need money to, to spend. And US stocks dropped, and actually like they did <laughs> very in the past, past week. And uh, taking a look at your asset allocation, uh, well, uh, I'm actually already underwater for all the stocks here. And what I want to do is to sell bonds. Well, my bonds are in my traditional IRA. And I am less than 59. Therefore, the IRS will have great fun hammering me with penalties if I were to do that. Well, I don't like penalties. So maybe we should do something else. So here is an example where you need to scratch your head a tiny bit more. Here is what I would suggest. Let's say that you want to withdraw 20K for your, again, for your spending. Then why don't you set it out of the US tax position in your taxable account? Yeah, you are going to pay some capital gains, but that's, that's fine. That's, that's normal, it's fair. But if I do that, then I sold US tax. That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to sell US bonds. Well, the answer is very easy. At the end of the day, in addition to selling your, your taxable uh, stocks in, uh, in your taxable account, you are going to trigger an exchange within your IRA. So you can trigger an exchange of 20K between US bonds and US stocks. So on one hand, you sold 20K of US stocks, but on the other hand, you sold 20K, you exchanged 20K of US bonds towards US stocks. The net effect is that you did what you wanted. You only, your asset allocation now will have uh, 20K less in, in bonds, but the IRS did not catch you with uh, some, uh, some annoying penalty. So think a little bit about it. Maybe uh, listen to my words again with the, the, uh, with the, uh, the recording. There is actually a wiki page which explains that process. And I, I'm just thinking about it right now. I don't have the pointer, but uh, it's a really nice trick in order to, to, to avoid uh, uh, withdrawing from, uh, from an ARA and uh, suffering from penalties. You just set in taxable, and then you make a move in tax sheltered in order to, to make the entire uh, move make more sense for you. Any clarification here, Greg? Uh, no, I think you asked me to remind you when it was one hour, it's now one hour. Okay, oh, well, I've been rambling. Okay, all right, so let me, let me move on. So the tr trigger methods, the, a common criticism of doing a periodic rebalancing, let's say once a year, is that it's a fixed date, birthday, January 1st, whatever, and it doesn't account for those times where markets go haywire. And here, again, this is kind of behavioral. So you might have a very disciplined profile and that really makes you itchy to be so far from your target asset allocation after a big, a big market change. And you don't want to wait month on month or maybe, maybe almost a year to come back to your target. Maybe that's what is bugging you. Or maybe you are a cold-blooded investor. You believe in the fact of using some form of dry powder to buy stocks when they are perceived as cheap and that you want to, you really want to rebalance. It's a perception, but again, perceptions drive a lot of decision making, unfortunately. So triggers are a way to implement something like that while being very disciplined about it. And I, I do exactly that personally. I'm, I'm more the, the first profile. Huh? 
they just hate to be too far from my target asset allocation. So a trigger can be a fluid percentage. If your target for US tax is 40%, if your current asset allocation is 35 or 45, you are more than 5% absolute from your target. And uh, that's where you rebalance. Absolute works well for simple portfolio, maybe three asset classes, two or three. It has some uh, weird <laughs> side effects when you have more asset classes. And there's this little tweak, which is called cumulative drift. And the idea is that instead of looking at each asset class independently, do I have something that changed by more than 5%? You look at it at, for your entire portfolio, you sum up all the variations, the positive variations, and you compare to a threshold, like 5%. So I'm going to show that in the next slide with this, with uh, making my little spreadsheet a little bit more complicated, but that cumulative drift, just summing up the deltas instead of looking at them independently, that's actually very, very easy to do. And it's, it's a pretty good way to approach it. Other people, uh, they prefer, like me, they prefer to have to relative math. So if your target is 40%, you want to rebalance when there is more than a 20% variation of those 40%. So 20% of 40%, that's 8%. So you want to rebalance when you get either on the low side to 32 or on the high side to 48. That is certainly a little bit more mathematically consistent, but that's not perfect either. And then there's this 525 rule, uh, which is kind of a combo of the two previous ways to approach things. If you have an asset class, which is a big chunk of your portfolio, let's say at least 20%, then the idea is to use the absolute mechanism. If you have an asset class, which is smaller, like tilts, where all my tilts are 10% of my, my portfolio, for example, then use the relative rule and the 25 says the 25 relative change. So I'm going to give names here uh, that has been actually pushed quite a lot by somebody well-known in the Buggleheads community called Larry Suedro. And uh, I'm sorry, Larry, but that rule has been very poorly calibrated. 25% uh, is way too much of a relative change and that occurs so rarely in history that it makes it pretty meaningless. So after studying numbers and history quite a lot, I would, if you want to use that combo rule, uh, I would strongly suggest you use 520 or maybe even 515. Otherwise your asset allocation will be a little bit too out of whack without that rule uh, uh, triggering you to act on that. That will make you uncomfortable. And that's, that's just not a good, very good idea. So those triggers, this is something you could do with an annual assessment. You do an annual assessment, you look at those changes, absolute, relative, whatever you like. And then that tells you, hey, do I want to rebalance or am I still within my margins? So that's fine, that works fine. Or you can be a little bit more glued to your portfolio screen, and maybe you are going to monitor your portfolio every month or maybe even every week, and you will decide oh, one of my trigger bands has been reached and I want to rebalance right now. Uh, so that's, again, those things are, it's really what makes you comfortable with, with it. I'm just explaining various ways of proceeding. So in another tab of my little spreadsheet, I added a little bit more math with computing absolute changes, relative changes, 
and also that uh, cumulative drift. So those formulas are not complicated. I mean, the absolute change is just a difference between the target and your current position. But it's kind of handy to have a cell for that because you can use conditional formatting, make it blink in red if, if you get other your, your, your rebalancing bands and just be more, more visual. Relative, that's not a very complicated formula either. It's just dividing one by the other and uh, making that a percentage of a change and, uh, and you have your relative change. So it's also extremely relative, extremely easy math for most watch it. And that cumulative drift that I was uh, speaking of, here, the idea is that instead, again, instead of looking at individual changes, you look at the sum of the changes, but you need to take a look at the sum positive changes uh, because otherwise the sum is obviously zero. And if that total drift, the sum of those ch positive changes is more than let's say 5%, this is when you might decide to act. So again, personally, if you want to play with absolute changes, which is extremely easy to perceive and to do the math, then I would suggest that you use that little cumulative formula. And that's, uh, that works a little bit uh, better for any, many types of asset allocations, including those which are a bit more complicated. So I, I do use a spreadsheet a little bit like that. Uh, I added conditional formatting, and I even went as far as adding a scheduled script, something that runs in the background every four hours, and then it sends me a time to rebalance email whenever uh, one of my uh, rebalancing bands are, are exceeded. So you might think that I'm too much of a nerd here. I am. <laughs> Again, rebalancing once a year is perfectly fine, but that personally that just makes me feel better to, to react relatively quickly when my asset allocation is getting too much out of whack. It's purely behavioral. So, so far I explained the basics. I actually was not pleased with the wiki page that we have, and notably the various studies which are linked from the wiki page. I always found those studies to be a little bit lacking, either studying a period of history that is too short, or uh, sometimes following reasonings that frankly make little sense to me. And uh, sometimes we see some articles claiming a huge rebalancing bonus and you actually figure out that their methodology is, uh, is hogwash. So I ended up uh, writing the numbers myself and uh, making it complicated. So I, what I wanted to do was to look at long investment cycles, let's say 20 years of rebalancing, and then using a database of weekly returns starting from 1880 for practical reasons. It's kind of hard to get weekly returns before that. And uh, I wanted weekly returns because I wanted to check those trigger methods where you might decide to rebalance on the, on the, uh, at any point in time. And then I wrote a study where I, crunching a lot of numbers, running rebalancing various methods and every possible cycle. So start on January 1st, 1980, start the 20 year cycle on the February 1st, 1980 and, and so on and so on. And just crunching all those numbers to try to figure out if on average, something was working better than, than something else. So, the, in blue, you see actually the links. This is published on the Bugglehead blog. Yeah, there is a Bugglehead's blog. Unfortunately, we have very few contributors. It's essentially Barry Barnett and myself. 
and uh, but here you have the links to those blog articles. So part one is doing is more or less what I just did, explaining the, the basics of rebalancing and showing examples. Part two is a much more thorough analy analysis. Uh, again, looking at every possible 20 year cycle in history with various asset allocations and trying to figure out if the very simple process of annual rebalancing can be improved. I, I perceive the fact that the annual rebalancing is really the baseline. This is the simplest process you can think of. So anything which is trigger based or whatever, uh, is there an actual quantifiable uh, benefit? Long story short, not really. And part three, I dove in more other topics. So what if I rebalance really, really often, like every week or maybe every month, uh, this dreaded idea of when we're rebalancing and some less conventional uh, asset allocation. So I would like you read that if you are interested. It's a little bit long, it's a little bit number heavy, but uh, I'm trying to illustrate a couple of graphs and then I will just jump straight away to the conclusions. So I used a lot of small graphs like that. And so the way it works is that we have an asset allocation to begin with. So arbitrarily here, I, I took 50% stock, US stocks, 30% bonds, 20% international stocks. At the very beginning, each of them is perfectly balanced. So here I chose to start early 95. And my little spreadsheet is letting things change as the stock market is doing its uh, gyrations. And here I elected to rebalance every 52 weeks, which is more or less every year. So every year you see that there is a rebalancing event, this little red triangle, and the asset allocation is coming back to its target of 50, 30, uh, 20. So here we have a very simple uh, rebalancing going on. And just to keep a little bit of history in mind, this little line here at the bottom is the, uh, this is the, the price of the S&P 500. So that helps to remind you when there was a big crisis or, or a big uh, bull market. So remember your history in the 90s, there was this giant bull market, steady growth, and you see it. Uh, every now and then, uh, the US stocks keep drifting percentage wise, then our rebalance keep drifting up, rebalanced, and, and so on. And the bonds did the reverse way around. They kept drifting low, lower because the US stocks were growing so much, rebalancing every year, and, and so on. So that was an example of a steady growth of the market. Then we have the internet crisis, which unfolded between 2000 and 2003. And we have some more dramatic changes here. You can see the asset allocation for US tax went as low as 40, the mid forties. And then we have the financial crisis where things happen much more fast, faster and, uh, and here we already see that asset allocations can change pretty dramatically when there is a very deep and sudden crisis. And this is where waiting a full year for rebalance is kind of hard to, hard to bear emotionally. So that's, this is a way I illustrated various historical cycles and really that shows you what would have been happening uh, in the past. The next graph that was showing you, this was using a rebalancing band with triggers. So I didn't go as far as Mr. Svedro. I used a re re relative band of 20%. And here 
you see that the red dots, the rebalancing events, are much more spaced out to begin with. So during the steady growth, uh, actually, we ended up rebalancing in 97, then in then mid 99. The internet crisis did not unfold that fast. Actually, it took quite some while to go down and then go up. So we have a couple of rebalancing events, but they are still relatively far apart, which really shows that those 20% bands are a little bit too wide. But then during the financial crisis, we have two rebalancing events in a row, which are one month apart. So if you are like me and you really don't like if your asset allocation is too far from your target, then you you would actually rebalance at those at those points. But again, a rebalancing trigger with the corresponding spreadsheet, this is a discipline. You define it at the beginning of, I mean, you define it once and then you follow it, whether emotions are un, uh, uh, unfolding or not. So here that clearly shows that the 20% rebalancing band, I think, is a little bit too wide. So here I narrowed it down to 15%. And then we see that we have more frequent rebalancing. I mean, you know, it's easy to backtest and look at things, but just 18 months before or before uh, two rebalancing events, that's actually quite some time. So the, those are the kind of graphs that I used in the in the blog to try to explain behaviors and the rebalancing methods. Uh, okay, so let me summarize a little bit my study. There is no question that rebalancing is a useful discipline to stay the course. This is, in my opinion, again the very definition of rebalancing. You want to stay the course. You want to come back to your target. And uh, I cannot emphasize it more. Trying to eke a little bit of a bonus, bonus out of rebalancing is illusory. Uh, when I quantified it, I just couldn't find it, or barely. Uh, the real point is to stick to your plan. So fact is, market timing doesn't work, even with a rebalancing algorithm that seems very intuitive, selling high, buying low, uh, it's all perception. Then I, I did a lot of comparisons between the various methods of periodic rebalancing, quarterly, annually, monthly, or all sorts of rebalancing triggers. And I just couldn't find one that ended up with a clear uh, financial gain. I did find a teeny bit of a bonus, teeny bit of a financial gain on average across everything I backtested, but that was more or less 0 0.1%, which is not much. That was quite random. It sometimes happened, sometimes did not. And after thinking about it, I actually figured out that that was just a side effect of the asset allocation drifting. If you rebalance once a year, uh, the if you sh show it on my little graph here, yeah, this one. If you rebalance once a year, well, on average, stocks tend to go up. And uh, so, if you wait 12 months to rebalance, that means that during those 12 months, you are slightly above your asset allocation. It's not always the case, sure. During crisis, that's not the case. But on average, fortunately, the US tax is going up. So if you wait on, wait 12 months to rebalance, then you are always a teeny bit out of whack towards more fast growing uh, assets. So it's kind of normal to get a bit of a bonus if you wait uh, long enough. Those rebalancing bands, which are very wide, you don't rebalance very often. Therefore, your asset allocation is drifting a little bit more towards stocks or, or for a longer time. And yeah, at the end, you make more money. But 
that's not what you wanted to do. Your plan was your target asset allocation. Your plan was not to let things drift. So what I'm trying to say is that the few rebalancing algorithms that seem to display a teeny bit of a bonus is just the fact that you let things drift, that you let things drift towards out of your, your target. And then what's the point? That's not what you wanted to do. That was not your plan to start with. So I think there's a lot of confusion about that and a lot of people showing, like I respect Dr. Bernstein a lot, really a lot, but he suggested to other rebalance or to rebalance every two years. Well, I think the, what he was in essence suggesting was to not stick to your plan. And I don't think that's what we should do. So I would say really the bottom line of all that number crunching, pick a rebalancing method you were comfortable with. If you like the annual idea because it is super simple, do it. If you like triggers because then you will, when there's a big change that will trigger you to go back to plan relatively quickly, do it. Whatever makes you feel good, but just make it a financial discipline and then enforce it and, and you will be fine. So before I stop rambling, again, I, I, my thinking shifted more and more from quantifying things to behavioral considerations. So, yeah, I actually just made that point. Uh, the psychology is important. The, if your rebalancing a method makes sense to you and makes you feel good, do it. And that might be the, the very first criteria in choosing how to rebalance. Triggers, annual rebalancing, that all works, just pick what you, what you like. And uh, coming back to that one-way rebalancing, if one-way rebalancing is really a flawed way of doing it, but if you really cannot stand the fact of buying stocks after a huge drop, then instead of trying to compute things with percentages and so on, I would suggest you define a very simple rule with a bond floor. And that's actually suggested in the wiki. So you may decide, okay, I want to keep at least X two or three years, maybe or two or three years of bonds covering my expenses. And, uh, I will not rebalance if that would break that rule. It's all about your mind. I actually don't think it's a very good idea, but if that makes you at peace, then okay, fine, why not? But again, pick something that makes you feel good. Personally, I use triggers because I kind of like rebalancing. It feels like a positive sentiment, like an opportunity. It gives me something to do when it's really easy to stay the course, but when there is a big crisis or maybe a big bull market, we all itch to do something, something, whatever, something. Well, rebalancing with a rigorous uh, definition behind, you will do something that is not damaging and that will bring you to your plan. But uh, I know it's on city, having something to do during a crisis, I mean, uh, personally that helps me. But you have to make it a mechanical process, no hesitation, no regret, no hidden market timing attempt. Uh, maybe I should wait one, one day, one more week. No, don't do that, just follow your process. And again, if I bored you to death and uh, you cannot stand all of those, considerations and spreadsheets and so on, then go for an only who had found and you will be taken care of and you don't have to think one second about it. So back to your question, Greg, uh, at the very, the very last slide of the presentation, which will be shared with everybody, 
you can click on those links. Uh, so the presentation is on Google Drive. This is a short link here, but you can just click on the link. The spreadsheet I used is here. There is a link. This uh, complicated article or nerdy article I spoke of is here, and there are three parts. The rebalancing wiki page is linked here. And there is an SEC beginner's guide to asset allocation and rebalancing, which I don't find super useful, but it's kind of a reference from the government, which is half handy. And I'm done rambling. Ah, wonderful. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Jerome.